throughout the week go back and watch and so we're so grateful for the extension of ministry amen amen well uh Reverend Patrick Jackson <laughs> did such a good job Mike did such a good job did such a good job until I'm just embarrassed to read it because <laughs> he was sounding like the devil and I said he devil and God all the <laughs> It was wonderful. One, you heard, you felt the tension in the text, hearing the different voices. Sometimes you got to do that. You got to hear the voices so you pick up what's going on in the text. So I ain't going to mess with it. Just read verse 1. <laughs> in whatever voice you want. <laughs> verse 1 of Matthew 4. Let's read it. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Just before you sit down, turn to a neighbor, say neighbor, if he was, so will you. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. This weekend, beloved, we are beginning a new series of messages, Dolly, that will deal with the issue and the subject of spiritual warfare. And uh, Marsha, the most condensed definition of spiritual warfare that I can give, Ramel, is that spiritual warfare is that battle that we are engaged in with the enemy of our soul that seeks to defeat and destroy us both spiritually and ultimately physically. Now, last night in the message, I quoted Pastor Jim Rayleigh out of Orlando, Florida, who wrote that one of the great dangers of the modern church and of Christians today is that so many do not believe in a real or personal devil and Mike Rayleigh goes on to say that the tragedy of that is Satan likes it that way because if he is not believed in he will not be prepared for okay you missed it if I don't believe in the devil then I will never prepare myself for the devil. And so there are many believers, and I hate to say this, Deacon Ernest Williams, but there are many preachers, pastors, occupying pulpits today who do not believe in a personal, actual devil. But I've come to serve notice on every child of God that to do that is a mistake of huge proportions. In fact, the Bible tells us that there are three things about the devil you and I must understand. First of all, he is real. All right. Bible says our adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil is real. Now let me say this. Let me say this, Ronnie. I need to hit this one quick lick. And I talked about it last night. And the devil does not look like the image on the red hot sauce bottle. C come on, Larry. Now, now y'all need to get that because if that is the caricature of the devil that we hold in our mind, then watch this. We will treat the devil like we will those kids who will ring our doorbell on Halloween dressed in costumes. We will think the devil is something to play with. The devil is real. 
Second thing the Bible tells us about the devil, Pop Murray, is that he is at work. Oh, God. <laughs> the devil is at work. In fact, I'm going to say this, and I hope you'll get my drip. The devil never takes a day off. He's working right now. In fact, he's in this room seeking to distract you, seeking to make you not listen, whispering in your ear, pastors up there talking a bunch of yang yang, you're too intelligent for that. The devil is real and the devil is at work. In fact, much of what we see going on in our world today is not the hand of God. It is the work of the devil. God, I want to say something. That man that climbed or got in that elevator and went up to the 32nd floor of that hotel and shot 500 plus people, killing 50 some of them, that was not God. That was, okay, y'all getting quiet. Because some of y'all been walking around Columbus. I don't know why God let that happen. I don't know why God did that. Well, I'm going to help you the same reason God let you do what you did. Now y'all send me some love. The same reason God let you go out here and act buck wild and do stuff you knew not to do and live contrary to how you were brought up. We are not puppets on a string. We are not Pinocchio. God is not Giuseppe. We are not robots or automatons. We are made with free will and volition. We are moral agents and God doesn't make us do anything nor stop us from doing what we want to do. That was the devil. That was evil that made that man do that. The devil is real. The Bible tells us. The devil is at work. The Bible tells us. And the Bible tells us, Uncle George, that he is already defeated. I'm waiting for it to rumble through the crowd. Y y years ago, Lawrence, years ago, um, I, I can't remember who it was that wrote that book. I almost called his name. He wrote that book, and the title of it is Satan is Alive and Well and Living on Planet Earth. And uh, I read the book. It's, it's a good book, except I take one exception to the title. He is alive. He is at work on planet Earth, but he ain't well. <laughs> Satan is alive. He is active. He is working. But ever since Calvary, he's had a very sick existence. Because the Bible says, I feel like preaching this, that when Jesus got up from the grave, he took the sting out of death. He took victory from the grave. He broke the back of the devil. I wish somebody could help me here. So I am not dealing with a champion who is undefeated. I am fighting a foe that's already defeated. I'm just waiting on the bell to ring. Satan is real, the Bible tells us. Satan is at work, the Bible tells us. And Satan is already defeated, the Bible tells us. But I'm convinced, deacons, that one of the things that will greatly aid and assist us in our battle with the devil, because even though he's defeated, we still have to fight. So, sort of like, um, sort of like, um, Sort of like, um, sort of, sort of like, um, yesterday with the Buckeyes, 60 what to 14, 
But in order, in order for them to have the game, they couldn't quit because they had rolled up the score. They had already won. Somebody told me the game was over in the first half. But they had to show up for the second half to qualify for the win. Y'all can cry on me. The game was won probably in the first. Okay, let's admit the game was won when they got off the bus. But they had to play all four quarters to qualify for the win. I'm trying to preach to somebody that likes football. And so here's what you and I've got to do. The devil's already defeated, but we still got to play all four quarters. One of the things that will greatly aid us and assist us in our battle with the devil is that we have to understand not just what we saw last night, the method, means, and motive of the devil, not just what we saw at 8 o'clock, the tactics of the devil to appeal to our innate need, our inner need, and our often impulsive streak. But we must also understand where this battle is being fought. Some of us have no idea where the battlefield is. And the Bible tells us that the battlefield on which we fight spiritual warfare is the battlefield of the mind. God, I feel like preaching my mirror. Now, most people, when asked or when thinking about the nature and the location of spiritual warfare or the nature and location of temptation, will assume that it takes place in the realm of the physical or the emotional. That the battle is in my body or in my heart and my emotions and yet beloved the reality is the spiritual warfare that you and I are engaged in is a battle that begins first in the mind and is only later manifested or revealed in the heart or the body Proverbs tells us Guard your heart. Do I have Bible readers? Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. And yet, beloved, watch this. Those issues that flow out of my heart are born, formed, and formatted first in my mind. Whatever is in your heart first came through your mind. It can't be, am I doing pretty good? It can't be Russell in my heart unless it passed through my mind. Let me prove it. How many of you have ever been in love. You may not be right now, but once upon a time, in a land far, far away, you were in love. Let me see your hand. Thank, ooh, look at y'all. We got a lot of lovebirds up in here. The four is still in love. Look at them. They just are grinning. <laughs> now watch this. When you were in love, Here's what you said. I love you with all my heart. My heart just goes pitter-patter <laughs> every time I see them. But now watch this. Before you could love them with your heart, you had to first of all <laughs> like them in your mind. You had to see them, be drawn to them, think about them 
Because one of the ways you know you in love is you can't get them off your mind. Hey, Thomas, are you with me? You meet a lot of folk, Pastor Kelly. You meet a lot. Hold on. Stop. You, when we were growing up, you, I didn't know nothing. You knew a lot of people of the fear of sex. I thought about the one from Malvern High. The, Go back. He said, go back to the pulpit. <laughs> no, I did. I, well, anyway, anyway. So, so now, now watch this. Watch this. I would almost guarantee you, you cannot think of her name right now. <laughs> He's saying no because Sister Kelly may be watching. <laughs> you probably can't think of her name right now. But when you met Trish... She never left your mind. Stay with me. And your heart followed to California because your mind was there. See, I'm not concerned about where your heart is. I'm trying to figure out where your mind is. Because wherever your mind is, your heart will follow it. Am I preaching pretty good for the 99th time this week? <laughs> Whatever is in your heart came first through your mind. Say with me, say whatever is in my heart came through my mind first. So, so here's the question. Why, this is the relevant question of the text, why does the spiritual battle of the warfare I am in with the devil why does it take place in my mind because I always thought that it took place in my body my hormones my my sexual um, my sexual being I thought it took place in my organs that's where I have the biggest child. I just, I just got this thing, and I just, and Lord have mercy. And see, you dwelling on your body, but really all of that churning and yearning and burning really is coming from your mind. I'm struggling with unforgiveness. That's in your mind. Anger, that's in your mind. So you got to understand now, the devil fights us. Everyone say, the battlefield of my mind. That's where this fight is being fought. That's where the, that's where the war is being waged. Which is why every believer ought to pray every day throughout the day. Lord, keep my mind. God, I felt that. He will keep you in perfect peace. Come on, Watkins. If you keep your mind stayed on him. So why? 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 Why, Deacon Yarbera, does this battle take place on the field of my mind? There are three reasons, Dolly. So glad to have... You know, I call Dolly my noise box. I always feel better when Dolly hit because I know her and Marsha are always going to say amen. <laughs> Here's the first thing. <laughs> there you go. Get it right on cue. <laughs> Here's the first reason that the battle takes place on the field of your mind. It's because our minds, the mind, contains information. Watch this, watch this. When we forget something, Sister McLeod, what do we say? That slipped my mind. Or when something's not important, Mom Mary, what do we say? That's not even on my mind. I am not thinking about that. The mind, beloved, is where information is contained, stored, and from where we 
retrieve it. Now, one more time. You don't retrieve information from your heart. That's why, that's why when somebody tells you they love with all their heart, don't be impressed. That's emotional. My mind is where information is stored. And when I want to pull up something, I don't reach in my heart and pull up a thought. I reach in my mind and pull up a thought. Now, we see this in the text, McQuinta, when over and over and over again, Jesus, when dealing with the devil, are y'all still awake? Refers to scripture. Every time the devil comes at Jesus, he retorts, he replies, he responds. It is written. Stay with me. He can do, oh, this is good. He can do that because scripture has been stored in his mind. God, I just said something powerful. Jesus doesn't have a Bible. He doesn't have a concordance. He doesn't have an iPhone or an iPad where he can open up an app and pull up some and find 50 verses to defeat the devil. He doesn't have a little card in his Bible. He doesn't have a Bible. He doesn't have Romans Road on a piece of paper. There is no Romans Road. He's about to make the road. But he has stored on the hard frame and main frame of his mind scripture. And he calls them back to remembrance because they are on his mind. From a child, Jesus has learned the scriptures. So when under attack, he calls them back to mind. So how does that work? Glad you asked. You always ask the right questions. Our minds contain information that come from three places. A, what we've been taught. Now, I'm going to say some, something, Marsha, and I want you to hear me. But, Bailey, Mom, Bailey, I'm going to say something. And listen to me. And it can be wrong. But if you've been taught it, it's in your mind. Jesus have mercy. Jesus have mercy. Um, how many of you are 50 to 70 years old? Raise your hand. You 50. Ooh. Sister C. She got these two little fingers up like this. Mike, did you raise your hand? Okay. I got to keep the saints honest, you know. If you're 50 to 70 years old and you're African American, you know that we were taught certain things. When I was growing up, I was taught. Your, you know, the same, the, your parents and people would tell you stuff that was so obvious, like they were giving you a revelation from Mount Olympus. So they'd say to me, Billy, like I didn't know it, you're dark-skinned. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. And they would say, now, you don't need to marry anybody as dark as you. <laughs> marry somebody a little lighter, watch this, to give your kids a chance. Now, now, now that says something to me right there because if, if being dark skinned doesn't give you a chance I'm in a world of trouble because when we were growing up this was better than this and we were taught that and Pop Whittington it ain't true but a lot of us believed it and a lot of us, Gary, still struggle with it because once you believe it and get it in your mind, 
It's hard to get it out. Thank you, Dwight. What have you been talking? And every now and then you got to go back and ask yourself, what have I been taught? Some of us as men were taught, you got to keep your woman in check. You know, you be out. You gonna let you you you? Hey, bro, bro. You gonna let your woman do that? You gonna you you, you gonna let your woman? You better check her. And a whole lot of men ain't married now because they checked her, and she checked out. Said, "Why are you checking me? I'm checking out." What have, you been, what, have you been, what have you been taught? That, because watch this, watch this. Whatever you've been taught is in your mind. Your mind is where you store your information. Your information comes from what you've been taught. Here's the next one, what you've been told. Now, normally what you've been taught is by people who you trust have influence. What you've been told can be by anybody. So if you've been told you're ugly, now you weren't taught that, but you were taught. If a teacher told you you're stupid, if a teacher told you you can't learn, if somebody told you you can't do something, you weren't taught it, but you were told it. Stay with me. And you, you and I may, is this helping anybody? And you and I may not realize it, but what we've been told is still in our minds. Whew. Here's the third thing. What's the first one? What I've been. What's the second one? And then here's C. And what I believe to be true. There's nothing worse than believing a lie. And yet most of us believe more lies than we realize. We believe that because I'm a certain gender, I can't do certain things. Because I'm a certain age, I can't do certain things. Because I'm of a certain socioeconomic status, I can't do this. I can't, I'm Hispanic, I'm black, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm whatever. So I can't do this and I can't do that. But you didn't read the Bible. I can do all things. I'm looking for the rest of my crowd because somebody else ought to be clapping. I can do all things through Christ who, come on, y'all, and you got to believe that no matter what you've been told, no matter what you've been taught, no matter what you believe to be true, let God be true and everybody else a liar. And God says you are fearfully, wonderfully made and you must believe his report. Your mind is where you um, contain and store information. That's why the devil fights you in your mind because he, he goes through like a catalog looking at all this stuff on your mind. And he plays, woo, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date myself now. He plays that record over and over again. And sometimes it's like, you know, when you had that little cheap record player. I know it was a record player. <laughs> that record player, and it, it would get stuck and just keep repeating. And you have to put a nickel or a quarter. <laughs> Y'all ain't with me. Y'all ain't with me. Because it got stuck in a groove. There are so, oh God help me say it under the anointing. There are some of you in this room and some watching online. Your mind is stuck in a groove and you keep playing the same stuff over. I'm no good. I'm a failure. I'm ugly. I'm black. I'm stupid. I'm fat. I can't do this. I can't. And it's playing over and over. But the Holy Ghost is about to drop a dime on you and move that on to another part of your story. Tell somebody, I am somebody. I can do all things through Christ. That is my new reality. Here's the second thing. God, I thank you. The mind not only contains information, the mind controls imagination. Whoo, Dwight, this is good. 
Now there are some scholars, some biblical scholars who hold that the temptation experience in the text all took place in the mind of Jesus. That Satan did not literally take Jesus to those places. But he showed them to him. <laughs> in his mind. And one of the most powerful things we have, beloved, is our imagination. And that is controlled by our minds. Here's what we say, Lisa. I'm not even going to let my mind go there. <laughs> you ever said that? You said, uh-uh, I ain't going to let, you know, something tell you, I ain't going to let my mind go there. Because you know that your mind could go there. And given your overly active, vivid imagination, there's no telling where your mind would end up. The devil fights us on the battlefield of our mind because your mind controls your imagination. Now, your imagination is fueled. My imagination, our imagination, Willie, is fueled by three things. I want you to write these down. A, images. 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 In fact, the root word of imagination is image. Your, imag Ooh. Your imagination is really a collection of images. Things you saw as a child. Images. Uh, I'm, I, Pop Whittington, I'm going to say something. I, I, they may have to edit it out. Um, because, you know, we're on RFD and, you know, we got to be careful what we say. But some, some men in this room, um, early on, we saw you Hefner just died the other week. Didn't he? Did he die? Mm, whatever. Um, they said he wanted to be buried next to Marilyn Monroe because he said to be next to Marilyn Monroe, to lie next to Marilyn Monroe would be heaven on earth. Whatever. <laughs> Some of us as men saw our first images of women in a Playboy book. Look up at me, Amante. Like he looking for something in his phone. <laughs> Our first image of a woman was in a Playboy book and that image was seared onto the consciousness of our minds. And that is how we see women because of our first image. Images are powerful. And they take our imagination. Can I teach today? Which is why pornography is, is very dangerous. Because pornography is not reality. You know, you see these people going for an hour. Ain't, ain't nobody going for an hour? Are taking lunch breaks and <laughs> they moving the cameras and and so you're not satisfied with your spouse can I teach pastor you so, so you're looking at your spouse comparing how the Buffy does Dallas when that's not real or you're comparing your husband to that dude in the film who's going for an hour. That ain't real. 
and your imagination has been polluted by the images you allow. Am I teaching pretty good? See, in the words of those great theologians, it's just my imagination. Once again, running away with me. Everybody say images. Here's the second thing. Impressions made by those images. Because Uncle George, every image leaves an impression. I just said something. God help me, Jesus. Which is why not only must you watch what you watch, you must watch what you're engaged in when you do it prematurely because that leaves an impression. Which is why you must, you must appropriate the blood of Jesus to cleanse you. To sanctify your mind with the washing of the water of the word. Come on, I need a church in here. Don't just ask Jesus to forgive your sin. Say, Jesus, my sins left an impression and I need you to help me deal with these images that have made an impression. I need you to wash my mind. And what, God, can I say this? So that I might not be able to not remember, but sanctify the way I remember. So that I don't remember it in a way I want to go back to it. I remember it saying, I never want to do that again. And then the impact made by the imp images that are impressed. And my God... Don't, don't the images that make the impression impact us? So we don't know real intimacy. We don't know real love. We don't know, we don't know relationships. We, 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 we just don't know because the image made an impact because it made an impression. And I'm living my whole life now um, bouncing around like, what's that game where you, the ball hits the things? and What's it called? Yeah, that just, and that's how I live my life. I'm just bouncing, bouncing, bam, 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 hitting up against stuff. And all of it is because I'm fighting the impact of impressions made by images. And it's affected my imagination. The devil loves to feed on and off of our imagination. Church, listen to me. He seeks to make things seem worse than they are. Come on. You know, on your job, in your marriage, in your church, he makes things seem worse than what they are. He wants us to assume the worst about things and people. It's his job on our imagination. But hey, y'all, hey, <coughs> he can't do that. You know what else he'll do? He'll make things seem better than they are. Look at her. She's so much prettier than your wife. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's at work. Why don't she take them eyeballs out and <laughs> take that weave out and peel that makeup off? You be looking at the bride of Frankenstein. You be running home. Thank you, God, for baby. Or he'll make, no, no, see, we don't believe that. He'll make things seem better than what they are. Here's how I know, because what we say is, I have finally found the perfect one. See, that's wrong right there. Ain't nobody perfect. Child, she meets all of my needs. See, I know that's a lie. Can't nobody meet all your needs. Come on, y'all, send me some love. I feel hostility coming. But, but he will make things. Things seem better than what they are. Well, let me close. This is a sermon y'all didn't want. <laughs> so what you and I got to do, Dolly, is watch what we feed our imagination and what we focus on with our imagination. 
Well, here's the third point. What's the first thing? The devil attacks us on the battlefield of our mind because our mind is where information. Our mind is where there is imagination. Y'all don't know? And then here's the third thing. The mind creates our inspiration. Now watch this. Fed by information, fueled by imagination, our minds then create our inspiration. Jesus is able to resist the devil and reject his tactics because he knows how to manage his mind. <clears throat> and his mind management gives him the inspiration to stay the course. He is able to manage his mind, what he lets in and how he processes it. And his ability to do mind management inspires him so that he is able to stay the course. Y'all are missing this. That doesn't start in his heart. That starts in his mind. And his heart follows. Another word for inspiration, beloved, is motivation. And motivation is always the results of three things. Here's the bottom line. If you are motivated to do something, you'll do it. But motivation feeds off inspiration. So there are three things. Write these down. The first is desire. Desire. Jesus desires to do the will of God. Stay with me. So no matter what the devil brings his way, he has made up his mind. Some of y'all are finally getting it. No matter what the devil brought his way, church, Marsha, listen, no matter what the devil brought his way, he had made up his mind. Okay, I'm going to try it one more time. No matter what the devil showed him, he had made up his mind. He has a desire to please God more than himself. <laughs> Y'all getting quiet on me. That desire produces discipline. Because you're never going to do anything with just desire. Desire must feed your discipline. Your discipline is the commitment to stay the course no matter what comes against you. God, can I preach today? So you say to yourself, I don't care how bad it gets, how tight it gets, I am not getting divorced. I am stay, I am committed to this marriage and I will discipline myself that I am not going to even consider divorce as an option. I'm not going to steal from my company. I'm not going to lie to the saints. I'm not going to live a hypocritical life. I am determined by the grace of God that my desire will cultivate discipline which will produce determination. And I want do I have anybody up in here that's got a made up mind that says I have decided that I'm going to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Would you look at your neighbor? Say neighbor. You got to have desire and you have to have discipline but you also have to have determination. Would you grab a neighbor by the hand and say neighbor oh neighbor you got to make up your mind. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. I'm going to serve God with all of my heart and if it costs my life I'm going to make it to the city no matter what I have to do is there anybody here that's got a made up mind the old folks said I mean heaven all the way should opposition come should foes obstruct my way should persecution fire be lit as in the ancient day with Jesus 
by my side his peace within my soul no matter if the battle's hot I mean to win the goal high five a neighbor say I'm going on in spite of trouble in spite of trial in spite of temptation I mean to go right on unto the final triumph I'm going on tap a neighbor say neighbor I've got a made of mine because I want to see him for myself I want to hear him say well done and is there anybody here that knows it will be worth it when your feet strike Zion and you see him for yourself is there anybody here that knows it's worth it when you hear him say serve it well done good faithful servant is there anybody here that wants to hear him say well done well done well would you grab a neighbor say neighbor I'm not letting you go back I'm not letting you turn back. You've come too far to turn back now. I know you get tired. I know you get weary. But faithful is he who has called you, who also will do it. And if God is for you, he is more than the world against you. So you don't have to wait up until you get there. You can praise him and you can shout right now because the battle is already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Yeah. Tell me, who can, who can stand before me? us when we call, when we call on that great name? Jesus, 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 Jesus precious, precious Jesus, Jesus, we have. We have right about it we have the victory Turn to a neighbor, say, you're a winner. Where does Satan fight this battle? It's not in your body. I know you thought it was because your body's always acting up. But your body is only feeding on what your mind is sending it. Uh, the other night, Dr. Olu Brown showed a clip of some people mountain climbing. My mind has never told my body, I think I want to climb a mountain. <laughs> it doesn't enter my mind. So my body has never asked me to do it because my mind has never given my body permission to. My mind has never sent a signal to my body. He really wants to climb a mountain. He just doesn't know it. And the only thing my body will do is what my mind instructs it to. 
you're sending your body signals. And you're trying to fight it in your flesh when that's not where the battle is. Would you move up higher? It's in your head. It's not in your loins. It's not in your reproductive organs. They are taking their signals from your mind. Your mind is feeding your heart and your body messages every day. You need a checkup from the neck up. You need to get your mind together. Because that's the battlefield this war is waged on. He knows it's where you contain all of your information. He knows it is what controls your imagination. And he knows it's what creates your inspiration that fuels your motivation. So he fights your mind. But the promise is. He will keep you in perfect peace. I don't do this often, but I feel led to open the altar for some of you to do some business with God today because the Lord has spoken to you about the battlefield of your mind. Images and impressions that have made an impact that are affecting your life information you were taught, told, or believed to be true that has now affected and impacted your inspiration, your desire, your discipline, your determination. All of that is happening right now. Shh. Right now in your mind. Because you know what I know is happening. Right now the devil is in your head. start moving now before he tells you another word. You better bust a move right now. You better bust a move right now. Because he's talking to you while I'm talking. He's telling you, you better not, you better not. You know what he just told somebody? You did it before, it didn't work. Then you tell him, but well, I'm going to do it again. on your mind what occupies your thoughts what you've been thinking about the battle is fought on the field of your mind that's where the war is and that's why you've been struggling so much to win it because you've been fighting it on the wrong field You've been staying under your body. I'm keeping my body under subjection. And that's what the Bible teaches. But you do that by your mind. That's why Paul said you're transformed, Romans 12, by the renewing of your mind. That's what brings transformation. Come on. I'm going to pray in a minute. But I want you to talk to God because I don't know what to tell God for you. You need to tell God, Lord, this is where I'm struggling. 
I was taught certain things. I was told certain things. I believe certain things to be true. And I have all this information stored on the mainframe of my mind. And I keep running into this wall. It's like a computer that has this security wall. Every time I try to break free, I run into that wall. And I need you to decode that for me. I need you to help me get my information right. Others of you, it's your imagination. You, you got to ask God, Lord, help me. I've been letting images and impressions impact me. In fact, Lord, they have um, really impacted the entirety of my life, and I need to deal with this. Things I saw, things I heard, things I did, and, and it made an impression and an impact. It's left something, and I need you to help me deal with it. And what's inspiring you today? What's motivating you? What do you desire? I think, was it last night, uh, the team, Minister Monte, the team talked about my desire. What do you desire today? What do you desire? What do you want? Because that starts in your mind. The image of yourself healthier. The image of yourself out of debt. The image of yourself mentally, emotionally whole. That starts in your mind and it tells your heart, now receive this. Your heart can only receive what your mind sends it. That's how you fell in love with that young man, that young girl. Your mind said, I like her. I like him. And you gave your heart permission. Glory to God. And then watch this. In your hands, your feet, your mouth followed what your heart did as ordered by your mind. So you called them or you wrote them or you stepped up to them. It didn't start with your body. It didn't start with your heart. It started with your mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Kelly, I want you to come pray. Come on, ask God to move in this place. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we come as a collective group, but we're here individually because each and every one of us has individual needs. We've got concerns and issues on our heart and on our minds that we need to lay at this altar before you. Father, all of the challenges, all of the images, all of the things, the imaginations that has impacted us over our lives, all a result of things that we've allowed to linger in our minds. And now, God, we come to you today to submit them to you, to sacrifice before you. God, would you wash our minds? Would you purify our minds? Would you cleanse our minds? In the name of Jesus, God, take off all of the things that are on the mainframe of our minds that are not like you. Everything that's not according to your will, that's not according to your word. Wash us. Purify us. Cleanse us again. Renew us, God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Blot out our iniquities and our transgressions. Take away everything that's not like you, that's not according to your will and to your word. In the name of Jesus. We surrender and submit our minds to you, Lord. Wash it with the water of your word today. In Jesus' name, God, we lean upon you. We rest upon you. We submit ourselves to you. We surrender all to you. In the name of Jesus, take us, Lord. All of us, Lord. Not just our hearts, but our minds as well. Our spirits, our souls, our imaginations are submitted before you 
In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you today. We thank you today. We thank you today that you're a restorer of the mind. We thank you today that you're a renewer of the mind. We thank you today that you're a reviver even of our minds. We thank you today. God, we lift up, hallelujah, our neighbors to our right and to our left. God, that you would restore them, that you would lift them, that you would renew them in their minds, in the name of Jesus. And now, God, we place our hands together. We celebrate you that it is done in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we glorify you now. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Oh, my God. Just, I want you to stay right where you are. Break it down. When Pastor Kelly was praying, and I, I understood why the Lord told me to have him pray, because he said something in his prayer, and the Holy Spirit quickened it to me, and I need you to do this for me. He said something, and I thought, Lord, that is a key. It's not, maybe not the key. It's a key. Almost every one of you who are, no, every one of you who are at this altar who are saved, you gave Jesus your heart. Today you got to give him your mind. The minute he said it, it hit me. That's where we missed it. We gave him our heart, but we didn't give him our mind. Lift your hand and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, today, with the same commitment that I gave you my heart, I give you right now my mind in Jesus' name on the altar as a sacrifice and an offering. I give you my mind. Thank you for receiving it, sanctifying it, washing it, and renewing it in Jesus' name. Now shout amen. That was the word. Give God your mind. God praise for his word.